Welcome to the Jongets Games tutorial for Summit using the cooperative mode. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I'll start by highlighting the cooperative mode, then I will end with an overview of the competitive mode as well as an overview for three of the game's expansions. Now, before we jump into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and gain access to a ton of exclusive content, then please go to patreon.com slash Games. Some of that exclusive content includes my dozens of opinions episodes episodes where I've covered my opinions on hundreds of different games, both the things I like and don't like about them, and I also come back to those games giving updated opinions as I play them. You can also gain access to some of my videos early and advertisement-free, and get access to an exclusive podcast feed where you can hear audio versions of all of my vlogs, including those opinions episodes. Now, coming back to this game, I do want to ask that if while you're watching this, some part of it jumps out to you as particularly interesting, then please comment about that down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles, because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. And I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. In it, players are ascending this mountain and then heading back down again. And today, I'll be highlighting the cooperative way to play. There's also a competitive way to play, and I'll briefly discuss that near the end of the tutorial. And there are also three expansions that I will give brief overviews for at the end of the tutorial as well. Now, as I said, the goal is to make it to the top of the mountain and then back down again. And in the cooperative mode of play, we can strategically use the positioning of our mountaineers to go up faster. This is because as we add these tiles in and move, we can be skipped over by other mountaineers. For example, the green mountaineer could go one, two, jumping over this spot because only one mountaineer could be on each of these not spaces. Now, as you move, you place new tiles out from your hand of tiles and the amount of movement that you have on each turn is dictated by the amount of weight that you are carrying, as well as your overall health. As you carry more and your health goes down, you won't be able to move as far during your turns. Now, movement is a crucial part of this game, but so is managing your supplies. In the cooperative version of the game, each player ascends the mountain with a Sherpa, and instead of moving on your turn, you can resupply with your Sherpa, topping off your oxygen, food, as well as potentially the items the Sherpa is carrying. You also don't always have to go up. You can descend back down to the camp to resupply if things aren't going very well for you. Now, at the end of each player's turn, they're going to roll each of these dice. The event die is going to potentially cause an event to happen from the top of this large deck here, and the weather die can force players to eat food, as well as cause blizzards to happen, which increase this track. If it reaches the top, then everybody loses. Now, there's more going on to this game than what I've talked about so far, and don't worry, I'll explain how all of this works in detail while we are playing. On that note, I think it's time to start playing the game, and for today's tutorial, we are going to play as, well, all of these characters because it is a fully cooperative game. This is the active player token, and that means that the yellow player gets to go first. Now, the first thing a player does on their turn is select one out of four different action options. The first of these is moving up to your movement amount on the mountain. The second is skipping your movement to draw new tiles. The third is skipping your movement in order to try and remove negative effects on your board. And the fourth option is skipping your movement to resupply from your Sherpa. As you can see, three out of these four involve not moving. And I'll explain these as we go. For the yellow player's first turn, as well as probably many turns at the start of the game, they are going to move. When moving, they can go up to their current maximum movement amount. As you can see, that starts at 6, but currently it is at 5 for the yellow player. The reason for that is because they are carrying so much stuff that it is slowing them down. Each of these tracks shows the various situation for the yellow player. Obviously, this is the movement track at the bottom. The second track is health. Now, they start at full health, but as their health starts to go down, you'll notice there are these movement steps. Each of these that is crossed is going to lower the overall movement that player can do by one. So if they were all the way down here, their movement would be lowered by four, and their movement is also affected by the weight they are carrying. As you can see, at the start of the game, they have four weight. They crossed one of these icons, which is why their movement starts here at five. If it was this situation, their movement would be lowered by one, two, three, four, five, and they'd only be moving one space a turn, which is probably not a great way to get to the top of the mountain and back. 
Now, you may be wondering where this weight is coming from, and that shows up on some of these other tracks. This is the oxygen track, and it's the amount of oxygen that the yellow player is carrying. They have two oxygen, and when they move from one to two, they cross a weight icon. That caused them to move the weight up once. Then there is food. They have nine food, and they crossed one icon, so that bumped them up once again. But when it comes to the other two weight, they have these two items they got during setup. Each of them shows a weight symbol, and that is why they have one, two, three, four weight here on the chart. And of course, when they go from two to three weight that they're carrying, their movement value is lowered by one. Now, that was a detailed way of explaining that they can move up to five times on this turn. Now, the goal of the game is to leave the base camp, make it to the top of the summit, and then back down again. In the cooperative mode, we have to have at least one player that successfully does that in order to win the game collectively and then score up our points and see how we did. If no one does this, then we all lose. So, Yellow is going to start moving up the mountain and they start the game here at base camp along with all of the other players. Now with each movement, they can move from where they are to one of these trail points, which are a knot in the rope. So that used one movement. Then they want to move over here, but there is no tile. That means they have to place a new tile here and they have these three tiles in their supply. Now these are the three different types of tiles. They have a neutral tile right here. They also have an ice tile and a thin air tile. Now, every time you enter a thin air tile, you have to consume one of your oxygen. And when it comes to these ice tiles, they generally have less paths and more of these trail points, which means it's slower to cross them. I think the yellow player wants to put this tile down right over here. And when tiles are placed, they must always match an equal side. That means you cannot do this because obviously that does not match. Now, they could do this or this. Both of those are legal. And they've decided to go with this. At this point, they've used one out of their five movement, so they can then go two, three, and then they can head this way or up. I think it makes sense to go up, so that is their fourth movement. And now if they want to go further up, then they'll have to place another one of their tiles. Of course, they've already used one of their tiles, and they don't draw back up to a full hand until the end of their turn. So they could place either one of these over here. That's not terrible, but this is a thin air tile. They've decided they're going to go for it, though. Now, as I mentioned, every time you enter a thin air tile, you consume one oxygen. So they are going to go from two down to one. Now, when they did this, they crossed over one of these weight symbols. That means they're actually carrying less weight. If they had managed to go from here to there, that would have increased their overall movement. And in that case, they could have potentially moved even further on this turn. Of course, they now have only one oxygen left, which is potentially a problem, but they'll have to deal with that as they ascend. Now, I mentioned they had to use the oxygen when they entered this tile. When they move from this spot to another spot on that tile, they do not consume any oxygen. If they move away from this tile and then back onto it, though, they will have to consume an oxygen again. For now, they've used all five of their movement. And with their main action done, they now have to roll the dice. This is the event die. And as you can see, it has four phases that show the event icon. If they roll a blank, nothing happens. But if they roll an event icon, they'll have to draw the top card from this deck and read it out loud and to do what it says. They also have this weather die that might force them to spend their food. So let's see what they roll. Okay, that is an event. And you must always perform the event before you perform the results of the weather die. So they have to draw the top event card and then read it out loud. Stomach bug. This is not a good way to start an ascent. It says the yellow player has to keep this card face up in front of them. And at the end of each of their turns, they have to lose one health or one food. So they'll add that over here. And that is certainly not a good situation to be in while climbing. Now they have to resolve this weather die. They rolled a single weather icon, and that means they have to eat one food. They'll go from nine down to eight. And of course, once you eat below one of these weight icons, that will lower the overall weight that you're carrying. On this die, there are three of the single weather faces. There's one sunny face, and nothing happens when you roll that. There's a double weather spot, which means you have to eat two food, and a blizzard. Now, the blizzard is going to move the blizzard track up and then force everyone to have to consume the item where the blizzard tracker is. Normally, the weather die only affects the current player. I do want to mention that if you ever need to eat food or consume oxygen and you don't have enough, you lose one health for each that you can't. Well, yellow is done resolving the dice, so now they can refill back to their hand limit. The starting hand limit is three for each player, and yellow has one tile. So they are going to draw new tiles from this rack right here. We can put them face up because this is the cooperative game, and we can all plan things out based off of the tiles that we have. 
The final thing yellow does is pass the active player token clockwise to the next player. Now, speaking of this token, I do want to point out that there are a variety of different active player tokens that you can use. Each one of these has a different once per game effect that you can use, and we are playing with the pickaxe. This means that once per game, we can ignore the movement penalties caused by an event. The other once per game effects can be quite nice. This med kit heals all of the players anywhere on the mountain for two. The shovel lets you remove one of these tiles and replace it with another one. The carabiner lets you move faster. So all of these give different effects. And again, we can ignore some negative movement that comes from an event, and that could really help us out in a pinch. So it's now the green player's turn. And I do want to point out that they have the same amount of movement as Yellow did. However, they have a higher maximum movement. Each of the player mats have differences with their overall tracks. So the green player could potentially move even faster than Yellow if they are not carrying any weight. Well, I think green does want to move and they have five movement to use. And I think they're going to go one, two, three, four, and then jump over the Yellow player to this spot for five. As I mentioned in the overview, there can never be two of these Mountaineers on the same trail point, and you can leapfrog over Mountaineers to go even further with your movement points. Of course, this is a thin air tile, so the moment they enter that tile, they have to consume one oxygen. They currently have two oxygen, so they can spend one of them, but they also have a special ability that is specific to them. This says on their turn, they may consume food to satisfy equal oxygen requirements. It also says you may stop players from affecting your movement. This bottom step over here is only used in the competitive version of the game, where players can mess with each other on the mountain. Now, the green player does have seven food, so they could eat one food instead of spending this oxygen. Although, if they spend the oxygen, that will lower their weight amount by one, and ooh, that's going to increase their movement by one. Yeah, they're going to go with that. So, as they move this over here, their movement goes up to six, which means they now have another movement to spend on this turn if they want to. I think let's have them do it. This is a pretty good tile for the situation. Once again, when you place this down, it must match the edge, so they would not be allowed to do something like this. With that sixth movement, they're going to head over here, and this is a neutral tile, so there are no effects as they enter it. Green is done with their action, so now they can roll the dice. They did not roll an event, so nothing happens there. Oh, and they got the sunny side here, so they don't have to consume any food either. And now they can refill their hand of tiles back to their maximum. And in their case, that is actually four. The reason for that is because they started the game with the maps and charts. That does increase the weight they're carrying by one, but it also increases their hand size by one. Now, if you happen to have tiles equal to your limit or more than your limit at this point, you don't have to discard down. You just don't draw any up. They have two and their limit is four. So they can draw two new tiles. Oof. They are both ice tiles. Now remember, there's no specific effect on these when you enter or move across them. They just generally have more trail points on them, which means it takes longer to get across these than the neutral tiles. Well, green is done, and that means the orange player can go. Their movement is five at this point in the game, and they are going to move for their action. They're going to begin by going one, two, three, and then instead of heading over here onto this thin air tile and consuming one oxygen, they've decided to head over this way. They're going to place this tile down. They still have two movement, and they'll go four, five, and stop over there. Now orange has to roll the dice. Oh, they did roll an event. That means they draw the top card, and it's snowblind. Discard your tile hand and draw a new one. So they lose the cards they have in front of them. Drawing a new hand isn't that bad, but they don't actually have to do this. The reason for that is because the orange player started with snow goggles. This does not even weigh them down, and it says they ignore exposure, frostbite, and snow blindness events. And this is the snow blind event, so they just ignore it. They don't ignore this, though. Those two weather symbols means they have to eat two food. So they'll do that going from eight to six. They crossed over this, so they have less weight to carry, so they can move their weight down. Now it's time for them to draw tiles, and I want to point out their special ability. It says on their turn, they may look at the top three tiles and replace them in any order, and their tile hand is permanently increased by one. So they can hold up to four tiles. They also get to look at the top three and then put them back in any order. They've decided to do that, and then these will be the two that they draw. All right, orange is done, which means yellow has to go. And before they take their turn, I just realized we didn't actually deal with the stomach bug they got in the first turn. It says at the end of each of their turns, they lose one health or one food. Now their special ability says on their turn, they can consume a food to gain two health. So it'll be easier to keep them healthy. 
and with that in mind, I think we probably would have lost one health instead of eating one food, since one food is two health, specifically for the yellow player. So their health would be here at the end of their last turn, and now it is their turn again. If we move with them, they'll move five times, although we can see they are one health loss away from lowering their movement amount. This stomach bug is going to stick around until we do something about it, and as I mentioned before, on our turn, instead of moving, they can try to remove one negative effect. The way this works is simple. They spend their turn rolling this event die. If they get an event symbol, then they can remove one card or token from their area. If they don't get the event symbol, nothing happens. So they have a two-thirds chance of removing this stomach bug so they don't have to deal with it. When you spend a turn doing this, you do then have to roll both of the dice at the end of your turn as normal. They've decided they want to try to get rid of this stomach bug earlier rather than later, even though they do have the ability to heal up better than their opponents. So yeah, they are not going to move at all, and they will roll this die. Nice, they got the event symbol. That means they can remove one negative effect, and the stomach bug is gone. It would have been a bummer if they did not get that effect. They could try to do that again in the future. Realistically, sometimes it takes time to remove these negatives. Now, speaking of time... There is a time track over here on the board. At the start of the game, we can choose any time to begin our ascent, and we decided to go with 5 a.m. Now that means we started at the beginning of day, and it's not great to be on the mountain after dark. Now this token is going to go up once after each player has taken one turn. So technically, at the start of the yellow player's turn, this moves up once to show it is now 6 a.m. instead of 5 a.m. Now in this way, if you spend potentially multiple turns trying to remove some negative effect, you are using up time that we all need to go up and down the mountain. If the time ever goes to night, then the movement value for all players is cut in half, rounding down. Also, the less time that we use getting to the summit and then back down again, the bigger our score will be as a team if we win the game. Well, yellow is done so they can roll the dice, and ooh, they got the first blizzard of the game, although we don't deal with that yet, they first have to draw an event card from the deck. The one they got is Keen Eye. It says if they have an open slot, one Sherpa may draw and carry a new item. Now this icon down here specifically shows that you only use this event when you're playing the cooperative version of the game, and the Sherpas only exist when playing in the cooperative mode. As you can see, some of these events are good. We've seen a couple bad ones, but this one is good. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually help us out. The reason for that is because at the start of the game, each of our Sherpas have the maximum of two items in their store storage, and we haven't used any of those items yet, so there are no open slots, which means this keen eye does not actually do anything for us. It's certainly better than a negative effect, though. Now, I will describe how we can resupply with our Sherpas to gain access to these items soon, but now it's time to deal with the first blizzard of the game. The first thing that we do is move the blizzard marker up once. I want to point out these icons over here. This is how you can specify the difficulty of the game. We are playing the intermediate level, and that means this marker starts here. If we wanted to play on the easy level, we'd start there, and we could also start up here if we wanted a progressively more difficult game. Again, we started here, and every time you roll a blizzard, you move this up once, and then every player who is not currently at base camp has to consume the indicated effects. This says one food, so every player needs to eat one food, not just the current player. This is the only time the weather die affects everyone. Normally, it just affects the current player. I do want to point out that further up this blizzard track, it will start consuming oxygen as well. So everyone has to eat food. And it doesn't look like that affected anyone's weight at this point. All right, yellow is done, and that means the green player can go. If they decided to move this turn, they can move up to six times. It looks like that's not what they've decided to do, though. Instead, they are going to skip movement and redraw their hand of tiles. One of their tiles is a thin air tile, which is going to consume oxygen, and the other three are ice tiles, which are much slower to progress up. And they just like to have a different variety of tiles for the future. So again, instead of moving, they can discard their entire hand of tiles, and then they'll draw a new hand. It looks like they got a couple of thin air tiles, but they also got a couple of neutrals. Now they have to roll the dice. There is no event, and it's sunny. All right. That means the orange player can go. And they've decided to move. Their maximum movement currently is five. And they'll start by moving onto this tile from their hand. That's one move. Then they'll go here for two. Then they will go here for three, which is going to potentially help out the other players, giving them a nice way to keep ascending. Then they'll go here for four. 
and place this tile up there, moving their fifth and final time. Now they can roll the dice. They have to eat one food, and there is no event. That food drops them down to four. Now they can draw tiles. Remember, they can look at the top three tiles and replace them in any order. However, they have a hand size of four and one tile, so they're going to draw all three of those tiles anyway. Ooh, not great. Two thin air tiles, and they have two ice tiles as well. All right, they're done, which means play goes to the yellow player, and we move the time track up once. After removing their stomach bug last turn, yellow is ready to move again. They can move up to five. Although the tiles they have to put on the mountain aren't great, but they're still going to go for this. Yellow is here, and they will go one, two, skipping over the green player. Then they'll go three, four, five, skipping over the orange player. So they don't actually have to place a tile down, and that's fine considering they have this icy tile and these two thin air tiles. Unfortunately for them, they are going to keep these tiles until they either use them or spend a turn ditching their whole hand and drawing back up again. Their action is done, so they can roll the dice. They have to spend one food, but before that, they have to draw an event card. And they got out of thin air. It says they have to place a thin air token onto your tile and each adjacent tile. Players entering these tiles must use one oxygen per tile as if it was a thin air tile, and you don't put this onto thin air terrain tiles because obviously that air is already thin. Now this is certainly not great. Yellow is here, and there's only one adjacent tile, but that means both of these are thin air tiles now. That is particularly not good for the green player, who hasn't entered either of these yet. As you can see, the game comes with a bunch of different tokens that can be placed either onto the board or onto player mats, depending on the specific events and situations the players end up in. Now yellow does have to eat one food, which brings them to six. They don't have to draw any tiles because they're at their hand limit. And now the green player can go, and they're a bit worried about their situation. They have one oxygen left, and they can eat food in place of oxygen, but they only have so much food as well. And if they use their six movement to head up here along with the other Mountaineers, when they move on to this tile, it'll cost one oxygen, and this tile will also cost an oxygen. Now, just because yellow and orange have gone up here does not mean the green player needs to. They can find their own way, perhaps heading up here or backtracking over to this spot and going up, although that is quite a big backtrack. Unfortunately, this is also a thin air tile. So the green player is currently trapped between these thin air tiles. And no matter what, they're going to have to hit one of them, which means they are going to lose an oxygen. Or again, in the green player's case, because of their asymmetry, they can spend one food for that. I think they are going to move, and I think they're going to head up here and suffer the consequences. Considering either way they go, they lose one oxygen, and heading up here loses another, but also lets them jump over both of these mountaineers. That feels like it probably is the right call. Now, the green player currently has six movement, so they can go one, two, and as soon as they enter here, they have to spend one oxygen. They can do that, which brings them to zero oxygen, which would be a much bigger deal if they weren't able to spend their food as oxygen. So fortunately, that ability is going to help them out. They've used two of their six movement, so now they will go three and then four entering this tile here. As soon as they do, they are going to have to lose another oxygen, which would normally cost them one health because they are at zero oxygen. But again, they can spend food for an oxygen, which brings them down to five. That also lowers their burden, so they can bring this here, which is very close to giving them another movement. The air is getting pretty thin up here, and at this point, the green player either needs to enter a tile over here that they place, or they could go onto this spot here. Because of this, they're going to look at their tiles, and they've decided to head over to the left. So they're actually going to land here. This is a neutral tile, thankfully, and it's also going to help them go up. At this point, they've moved one, two, three, four times, and they have a total movement of six. So they can go here for five. And then if they want to move over here and continue up, they'll have to place one of these thin air tiles, which they don't like the idea of. Each of them will help them go up swiftly, but again, losing more oxygen or food in the case of the green player could be a problem. They do have this neutral tile, but unfortunately, placing it here would not give them another position to move to. I think we have to be sparing with our resources. Let's not use that last movement, and that will allow Wilma the ability to place a tile here. We can see that Wilma has these ice tiles. Remember, ice just means there are more locations to travel on, which isn't that big of a deal. It is certainly better than losing oxygen. So yeah, the green player will let the orange player trek this part of the trail, putting one of those tiles down. 
Green is done with their action, so they can roll the dice. They will have to perform an event. So they'll draw this one, and it's a whiteout. No players may move until the end of your next turn. Wow. Okay, that's not good. So we're essentially stuck on the mountain, not able to move until the end of the green player's next turn. So I suppose we're going to be not moving for the next few actions. Also, the green player needs to eat one food from this weather die. So green goes down to four food. Then they will draw a tile. Nice. It's a neutral tile. And now the orange player can go. Of course, they can't move because all of us are in the middle of a whiteout until the end of the green player's next turn. Fortunately, there are other things to do besides move, and the orange player has decided they're going to do the first resupply action of the game. When you resupply, you are not allowed to move at all, which is fine. They can't move anyway due to the whiteout. And in order to resupply, you either have to be at a base camp, or in the cooperative game, you can always resupply if your Sherpa is still with you. Each player's Sherpa is represented over here on the board. As you can see, the Sherpa is carrying extra oxygen as well as food and up to two items that the player can swap out for. Now, these items are not considered equipped by the player, and when they resupply with the Sherpa, they can take as much oxygen and as much food from the Sherpa as they want, and they can also take items. With this in mind, let's look at the items that the Sherpa is currently carrying. This shovel does have two weight icons, so it's going to slow you down, but for an ability, it says you can skip movement to remove one adjacent unoccupied tile. You cannot use this on base camps, the summit, or on solid ground. So this can be a powerful way to change the trail as we are going up it. The other option the Sherpa has is three weight, and it is skis. It says you double the move value when descending. You cannot combine this with other movement bonuses. So skis will be a great thing to have around when a player is heading back down from the summit, although neither of these make sense to have right now, I think, for the orange player, but they do need to resupply with oxygen as well as food. When you resupply, you can take as much as you can hold. Of course, keeping in mind, the more you hold, the heavier everything will be, and the slower you will move. I do think they are definitely going to take at least four food, so they'll bring this from four up to eight. They crossed one weight symbol, so that moves this here, and of course, they have to remove four food from the Sherpa track. It started at 11, so it goes to seven, and the orange player could technically hold up to two more food, but that would increase the weight they hold, and it would slow them down a bit. That being said, having that food is probably worth it. Yeah, they're going to take two more food, so the Sherpa's supply goes from seven down to five. Their supply goes all the way up to ten, and that is heavy. They move this over, and that is going to lower their movement by one. So their maximum movement is four per round. And if they take one more weight, it's not going to lower their movement. So they figure they certainly should take at least one oxygen. That will push their weight here to six. They, of course, have to lower the oxygen their Sherpa is carrying by one. And every future oxygen they hold from this point is going to increase the weight they hold. And in fact, they can only hold one more weight total. That being said, they do have this flask, which is an item that costs a weight, and they could drop it in order to free up that space. Now, this flask says you can discard this to ignore the blizzard requirement once, and you may share this with players on your and adjacent tiles. They also ignore the blizzard requirements, and it says you gain one karma per share. Now, that specifically at the bottom relates to the competitive version of the game. There is no karma when you're playing the cooperative version. Now, I think Orange is going to push the luck. They're going to drop this flask onto the trail. That means the weight they're carrying goes down by one. And then to show that this flask has been dropped off at that specific spot, they place the flask into the one item slot and take the one token and put it underneath them. What that means is the flask has been dropped off at this position, and it is a free action to drop items as well as pick items up as you move. So that means anyone, including the orange player later on, could pick this flask up again when they are at this specific spot. The next time somebody wants to drop an item off, they will put that item here and put the two next to it. And if there are ever five items dropped off and you want to drop a sixth one, then the oldest one is going to be buried in the snow. We discard the card, put the new card there, and move that token over. Now, in addition to these item cards, you can also drop your oxygen and food. If you drop oxygen, then you simply place the oxygen token at the spot where you're at, so you or somebody else could pick that up, and you might do this in a moment where you really need to free up that weight. 
However, if you decide to drop food onto the trail, it immediately spoils and it disappears. You don't place any tokens down for that. You again might do this, though, to lower your weight requirement in order to overcome the specific situation that you are in. Well, speaking of weight, it looks like the orange player can take one more weight without lowering their movement more, so they are going to take another oxygen from their Sherpa. That increases their weight to six. They could hold one more weight worth of items if they want, but that would slow them down to three movement. I think they're going to stop here. So that finished their resupply action, but I do want to reiterate that you can resupply with your Sherpa anytime you have the Sherpa in the cooperative game, or you can resupply when you are at base camp. In the cooperative version of the game, base camp is down here at the bottom. In the competitive version, there is also a camp halfway up the mountain. Now, when you resupply at camp, you can take as much food or oxygen as you want. You can also gain new cards. And if you want to resupply your Sherpa, that is going to take another turn. So if you go to a base camp and want to resupply both, you'll spend one turn resupplying yourself and then another turn resupplying the Sherpa before you can proceed to move up the mountain again. All right, orange is done so they can roll the dice. Wow, we've been hitting a lot of these events. The one they got is Old Trail. It says they immediately draw and play a tile. It does not need to be connected to existing tiles. Interesting. Okay. The tile they draw is this one. It's neutral and it's pretty great. Yeah, I think it's just going to get placed right over here. When we can move again after this whiteout is done, that's going to be a great way to head quickly up the mountain. That was a pretty great event. Unfortunately, the orange player does have to eat two food now. Maybe we should have had them pick up that extra oxygen because when they eat that food, their weight requirement goes down like this. Well, orange is done with their turn. They can look at the top three tiles, though, and put them back in any order of their choice. And they have done so. All right, yellow is up and time is passing. It is now eight o'clock in the morning. Now, before the yellow player goes, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the summit. Now, obviously, that is the name of the game, and the goal of the game is to reach the summit and then head back down to the base camp. In the cooperative version of the game, the only way we all win is if at least one of us is able to do that. It's possible that some players might not make it. <laughs> they might run out of all of their health. If that happens, they lay down at the spot they are at on the trail. They no longer block that position, and their companions can pick up any items from them as they walk by. That's a pretty dire situation, but all players win if at least one player makes it to the summit and back down to the base camp without perishing. If that happens, you will score points based off of various things you've accomplished, and we'll talk about those later on. Obviously, the green player is still healthy, and yellow now gets to go. They, of course, can't move because we are still in the middle of that whiteout, and I think they are going to resupply with their Sherpa as well to take advantage of this situation. Let's take a look at the items the Sherpa is holding. Both of them have two weight icons. This shelter says you can discard this to place a shelter token onto the current tile. Players ignore food requirements when they are at this tile or may skip their movement to remove the shelter token and take this card. Oh, you can pack the shelter up and move on to another spot on the mountain. The other thing this Sherpa is holding is sleeping foam. It says once per turn, you can roll the weather die and you gain one health if the sun or the single weather icon is rolled. Both of those seem great, although the yellow player does have the ability to spend their food to help heal themselves, so I think for the moment, they're not going to take either of those items from their Sherpa. Instead, they are certainly going to supply up with food. I think they're going to take up to their maximum. They currently have six, so they can pick up six food, and they will only cross one of these weight icons. That isn't even going to cost them a movement penalty. That being said, the movement penalty is coming because they should also pick up some oxygen. I think let's have them take two oxygen. That will increase the weight they're holding by two, which brings them up to their carrying capacity. And that does lower their speed down to four movement. I think that's all yellow is going to do. So they can roll the dice. Ooh, and it's a blizzard. <laughs> the orange player just dropped their flask. This uh, isn't great. Now, before we get to that, we do have to deal with this event, and it is Family Ties. It says you ignore this if you have no Sherpa, but the yellow player does. Below, it says your Sherpa and one other Sherpa may gain two food and one oxygen. Oh, nice. This is going to do a small resupply specifically for the Sherpas. Yellow's Sherpa will gain two food, bringing it to seven, and one oxygen, bringing it to five. And then I think the 
orange player Sherpa will gain an oxygen and two food as well. Now the blizzard hits. This moves the token up, and every player who's not currently at base camp must consume two food. Unfortunately, that is everyone. The orange player just resupplied, and they have already consumed four of their food. That's not great. Their weight requirement does go down, though, which will increase the amount of movement they can do by one. Orange eats two food, and so does the green player, and that lowers the weight requirement for green by one, which does bring their movement up to their maximum of seven. Well, yellow is done, they don't have any tiles to draw, and at the end of this turn, the whiteout will be over, thankfully. So I think the green player is going to resupply, considering they are almost out of their resources. Let's take a look at the items their Sherpa is holding. This is a piton. It says you discard this to place a piton token onto the current ice tile. All players may increase their movement by two on this tile. Remember, ice tiles are slower because there's more of these spots, but the piton on that tile is going to essentially negate a couple of those trail points. The other item is trekking poles. It does take one weight to hold, and it says it increases your movement by one, but you do increase the health loss by one due to the slide, fall, and accident events. Now, this is a pretty great item. It does bring on one weight, but it does make them quite a bit quicker. I think the yellow player is going to swap their maps and charts out for the trekking poles. The maps and charts increase their tile hand size by one, but I think movement is maybe going to be more important. They'll put the trekking poles here, and that does not change their weight situation. Now, they really need to supply up with food as well as oxygen. For food, they can hold up to seven more, and I think they're just going to take seven. That moved them over three of these weight icons. And that moved them over two of their movement icons. Their Sherpa goes from 11 down to four food. And then they should definitely take two oxygen. That lowers the Sherpa to four and increase their weight by one. So this goes here and that does not affect their overall movement value. Now they could increase their weight capacity by two more, but that would drop their movement down to three. Although they do have those trekking poles, so they would still be moving four. Maybe that's what they should do. Yeah, I think they're going to do it. So they'll gain two more oxygen, which will increase the weight they're holding by two. And that lowers their movement down to three. But again, they're at four because of these trekking poles. They did pick up four oxygen total, which means their Sherpa is only holding two more oxygen. Well, that's finished their action. And they roll the event die, but they don't get an event. That's nice. They also have to consume one food, which is fine. And now the whiteout conditions are done because that was drawn on the green player's last turn. So we can start trekking up the mountain again. The orange player now can take their turn. They have a movement value of five. And from this position, they are going to jump over the yellow player for one movement. Then they'll jump over the green player for their second movement and their third movement brings them here. They do want to continue hiking up, and they have two more movement. They're gonna place this ice tile there, and then go one, two. That's finished their movement, so they can roll the dice. Ooh, no event, and it's a sunny day. Nothing is consumed. That's pretty good, considering the orange player was really digging into their food after that resupply. Now they can look at the top three tiles and put them back in any order, and then of course draw one. So they can essentially draw the one that they want. All right, the yellow player is up and time moves forward once. Then yellow is going to move. They have four movement, but before we do that, let's take a look at the yellow player's items. They've had these all game long and the first one is helmet. This is taking up one weight and it says they can discard this to ignore all health loss due to an event card. They also have this rope. That says you can discard this to increase your movement by three for one turn, or you can combine this with the harness or figure eight descender to get a different effect. Now these are heavy items that they are carrying and the benefits can be pretty good. It might make sense to use this rope sooner rather than later to free up that weight and get the movement benefit from it. Now, once again, yellow has four movement currently. And with that, they will go one, two, three, four, just barely entering that ice tile. Now they could use their rope to move onto this spot here. However, the yellow player's tiles are not great. This ice is not the kind of thing they want that won't get them up to the peak. And these thin air tiles are obviously bad because they will eat into our oxygen. So I think yellow is going to hold onto that rope until there is a better time to use it. So they can roll the dice and no event again, but they do have to consume two food. That brings them down to eight and it lowers the weight that they are holding by one. They don't draw any more tiles. 
which means the green player now gets to go. And they have a base movement of only three. They are very encumbered with everything they're holding. However, these tracking poles will increase their movement by one, so they can move up to four times. I do want to mention they have another item. This is Dexamethasone, and you can discard this to cure altitude sickness immediately. Having this is fine. It doesn't cost any weight, and there is no limit to the amount of item cards players can hold, beyond, of course, the weight limit that players can hold. So green is going to move four times. They will go one, two, three, four, just barely not making it to the next tile. That's a quick turn for them. They can roll the dice, ooh, and they have to do an event. It looks like they drew an equipment malfunction. They immediately discard one item and they lose two health. They ignore this card if they have no items, but they do have items. Yuck. I think the dexamethasone is going to be the malfunction. The trekking poles, I think, are too important. So this is discarded, and unfortunately, they take two damage. That doesn't quite lower their movement, though. Then they have to consume two food, and that will lower their weight to here, which does increase their movement by one. Green is done, which means the orange player can go. And they are going to push on ahead. We are all starting to get quite close to the summit. Orange has a movement of five. So they will go one, two. And they have this neutral tile they were able to search for on their last turn. That will go here as we continue to go straight up this mountain, it seems. So two is here, then three. And then I think they're going to place this thin air tile here for the four and five. Of course, when they enter this tile, they will have to lose one oxygen, but they have quite a bit of oxygen after that last resupply with their Sherpa. So they can lower this here, and that lowers the weight that they're carrying by one. They could have placed this tile down, but they decided to prioritize speed over reserving that oxygen, and hopefully that doesn't end up hurting us in the long run. Well, orange can roll the dice. They did get an event. And it is Sherpa Slips. You ignore if you have no Sherpa, but the orange player does, and they immediately lose two health. They cannot lose their last health. Okay, that's going to drop them here, but that doesn't quite affect their speed. They do have to consume one food, and then they can draw the top three tiles and put them back in any order, and then they will draw two, and these will be the two that they want. All right, orange is done, which means yellow can go. Time is going to pass. And now yellow is going to move. They have a movement value of four, and they can add three to that with this rope if they want. Yellow is here, so they will go one, two, three, four. And then they are going to use their rope. That will get them three more movement. So they can go one, jumping over the orange player, two, three. And of course, these are thin air tiles. This one and the summit are both thin air, you can tell, with the orange ropes. So that means the yellow player does have to use up two oxygen. That will lower the weight they're carrying by two. So this goes here. And of course, they also lost one weight when they used this rope. So that will bring them here. And that's actually going to get them two more movement back that they can use immediately. That's great. Although <laughs> their oxygen situation is a little dire. That being said, with the extra two movement, they have made it to the summit of the mountain. Now, specifically, this location at the very top of the summit tile is the summit. And if a player reaches the summit, they can place this flag right over here to show that they made it. Now, other players are allowed to skip over a player who's at the summit, and they still drop a flag to show that they got there. And of course, as I mentioned before, the goal of the cooperative game is to get at least one of the players to the summit, and then back to the base camp without perishing. Again, you perish if you run out of health, and one of the big ways you can lose health is if you need to consume food and don't have any, or need to consume oxygen and don't have any. The players have consumed quite a bit of food and oxygen heading up the mountain so far. Of course, they've all done a resupply action with the Sherpas so far, but the Sherpas themselves only have so much stuff, and getting to the summit is only half of the journey, realistically speaking. Now, at this point, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the end of the cooperative game. As soon as a player has made it to the summit and all the way back down to base camp, on their future turns, they can decide to either continue playing, which means they can move around, maybe helping players by moving up and giving them supplies, but they will have to roll the dice at the end of their turns, 
Or if you are at the base camp and previously reached the summit, then you can fly home. That just means you have left, so you remove your token. You effectively won't take turns from that point out. And as soon as all players have either flown home or perished, the game will be over. At that point, as long as one person flew home because they reached the summit and came back, then all of the players win and you can count up your points. If no one did, then all of the players collectively lose. Now, if we win, we do gain points for a variety of different things. The first thing is every surviving team member is worth five points. You also get three points for every team member that reached the top of the mountain. In addition to that, you get one point for every health on your surviving team members, and you also gain points based off of the amount of time that you took. The way this works is you will take 24 and subtract from that the number of hours that were spent in the game, and you add that result to the rest of your points, you sum all of that up, and you will have your score for the game, and you can compare the scores of your future cooperative wins with the scores of your previous ones to see how each of those games played out. Now once again, at this point in the tutorial, the yellow player has made it to the summit, but they have a long way back down again. They only have one oxygen left in their tank, but their Sherpa does have five oxygen, so I imagine they will probably be doing a resupply in the near future. Perhaps they would even stay at the summit to resupply there on their next turn so that their teammates can jump over them on the summit to make that a little bit faster to reach there and come back down again. Now you can come back down the same route that you used, but there is some oxygen loss with thin air on this route it might make sense for them to head down over here perhaps even overshooting all of this thin air to come back through this spot and make it down to the base camp of course they could just head down this way but there is a lot of oxygen loss in that direction now i think at this point i'm going to stop playing through the cooperative version of the game and it is now time to briefly discuss how the competitive version of the game works and then we'll finish the tutorial by discussing three expansions that can be added into the game when playing the competitive version, the first significant change is the fact that you use the other side of this board. As you can see on this side, we have a blizzard track which works just the same as the cooperative version. There are also spots to drop off items that again works the same as the cooperative version. However, over here we have a karma track instead of the locations for the Sherpas. There are no Sherpas in the competitive version of the game. The summit and the base camp tiles are going to be the same as the cooperative version. They are aligned down here based off of the difficulty that you are choosing. But then there is also a halfway tile that is placed on the board, once again aligned with the position of your choosing. And the gameplay for the competitive version works quite similarly to the cooperative version. On a player's turn, they're going to take one action, then they will roll the dice, and if they get an event, they draw an event and then read what happens, and then the weather die works in the same way. I do want to point out that in the event deck, there are a series of cooperative only cards. You have to remove those and then add the competitive only cards in. There's also a bunch of cards that work in both versions of play. Because there are no Sherpas, instead there is now another base camp in the middle of the map where you can resupply. Now player movement works the same as the cooperative version, with the only exception being that players can deny other opponents from being able to pass over them. Remember, we had leapfrogging as we were playing situations like this where green is here and then yellow jumps over well they have to ask for permission from green to jump over first if green says yes they can jump then not only does the yellow player get to move over without spending a movement but the green player's karma token is going to go up once on the karma track over here so if green was here by letting the yellow player jump over them they would shift up there and the number on this track where the token is at the end of the game is the amount of points that you get so the green player just got two points However, if green denies the leaping over, then yellow can't jump over, but the green player moves down twice on the karma track because they blocked their opponent. Speaking of karma, when playing the competitive version, you shuffle up this large deck of karma cards, and players will have a hand of these that they will draw back up to their maximum for at the end of their turns. These cards let you do a wide variety of things that interact with your opponents. For example, Thief. You can take one item of your choice from the target, and up here, we can see this is going to lower your karma by two, and that clock means you can play this at any time. Now, you can only lower your karma if you are at a position on the track to spend it. For example, if your karma was at zero already, and you needed to go down twice, you could not because you don't have enough space to go down. However, if you are at the top of the track, you can continue to gain more with no extra benefit. Now, I mentioned earlier that each of the player boards have special abilities that apply to the competitive version, usually stopping various things from being taken. 
For example, the yellow player says you may stop players from affecting your food. Now, this really comes into play with these karma cards because, of course, they can be played to take food away from people or force food to be removed. Now, the final significant change when playing the competitive version involves the halfway camp right here, as well as these spots on the left side of the board. Now, as players are hiking up the mountain, they may stop at the halfway camp on the way up or down. You don't have to do this. You can bypass the halfway camp, but by stopping here, you're going to place one of your flag tokens onto the highest victory point number that is currently uncovered. So it's essentially a race to get to these spots in the game. For example, the first person to reach the halfway point on the ascent is going to get four points, and the second person to do this will get three. Once a player reaches the summit, they will place another flag onto the highest number over here. The first player to do that will get eight points, and the second player will get six. On the way back down, if you choose to stop at the halfway camp again, then you'll once again place a flag token on the highest number, and then finally, when you reach the base camp to finish the game, you will once again add a flag to the track, so as you can see, the earlier you do all of these things, the more points you will get. And remember, it's optional to visit the halfway camp. So it's possible you might end the game just having reached the summit and the base camp at the end without reaching the halfway point. Although there's a bunch of points here and resupplying as a possibility. So it's probably not something that you should actively try to avoid. Now, much like the cooperative version, players can perish on the mountain in the competitive version, and if you perish, then you will lay down on that spot, and you can no longer stop people from going through your position, and you will also not take any more turns, but you can still play karma cards from your hand. You won't draw up any more of those cards, however, and once a player reaches the base camp after reaching the summit, they can fly home after their turn, and of course, they do roll their dice at the end of that turn. Once all players have reached the base camp and flown home or perished on the mountain, the game will be over and we will count up our points. The points that we get are going to be over here on the spots where we placed our flags and over here on the spot where our karma token is, and the player with the highest score will be the winner. At this point, I'd like to finish off the tutorial by briefly discussing these three expansions that can be used when playing the game. The first expansion to discuss is Teams. Now, this brings in two new characters with their specific abilities that can be used. And not too surprisingly, the Teams expansion lets you play in teams. You can do this with both the competitive scoring or the cooperative scoring. Now, when you play this mode, all of your teammates are working together. And if playing the competitive version, you count up the points between the teammates, add them together, and the team with the most points is going to win. Teams can have two or three players on them. Instead of scoring the competitive mode, you can score the cooperative mode as teams. You count points up just like we discussed in the tutorial for the cooperative mode, but each team will count these points separately, and then the team with the most points from the cooperative scoring in the game is going to win. Now this expansion brings in new cards that you can use, and importantly, a new mechanic called ladders. Now as you can see, these ladders are square-shaped tokens, and at the start of the game, each player is going to gain one of these ladders, and it will take one weight to hold as they continue up the mountain. Now, while a player is ascending the mountain, they can place this down instead of one of these tiles. And in fact, you can even cover up these tiles. As you can see, the ladder is going to cover those and make a more direct path through the tile. These ice ladders have some spots you have to stop on, whereas the thin air and neutral ladders don't. You can just go from this spot right over there. So these ladders can make traversing the mountain much quicker. Of course, your opponents can use those as well after you have placed them down onto the board. The next expansion to discuss is Yeti. As you can imagine, there's a Yeti. <laughs> you place this Yeti up here at the summit of the board, and you can use this expansion in the cooperative and competitive modes. Now, during the game, when you're playing in the competitive version, after the weather die is rolled, the Yeti is moved by the current player based off of the roll on this die. If a sun is rolled, the Yeti doesn't move at all. If a single weather icon is rolled, the Yeti moves once, twice, and then finally three times, because the worse the weather is, the easier it is for the Yeti to traverse through the snow. Now, the Yeti does not move on trails. Instead, they move from the intersection points of the specific spots on the board. For example, if the Yeti was here and you rolled a two, then you could go one, two, or one, two. There does not need to be tiles on the board for the Yeti to move. That being said, if there are players on the tiles that the Yeti moves along, then the Yeti attacks the players. They have to either lose one health or two food. 
Now, the Yeti's movement cannot be wasted. You cannot go back and forth. And as the active player in the competitive version, you are obviously going to try and send the Yeti after your opponents to injure them and take their food. It's worth noting, when the Yeti moves across a tile multiple times, there's still just one attack for all of the players that are affected there. Now, I did mention you can play this expansion in the cooperative mode, and in that mode, the Yeti is going to move just like in the competitive version, except it is going to move towards the healthiest player on the mountain. It will keep heading towards that player, doing damage or taking the food, until there is a new healthiest player, at which point the Yeti will change direction and head towards that person. I do want to point out that this expansion brings in new cards to be shuffled in for both the competitive and cooperative versions of playing with the Yeti. Finally, the Yeti expansion also brings in more climbers that you can choose to play when using any of the expansions. The final expansion to talk about today is Sanity. Now, this expansion is all about managing your internal focus and sanity as you are struggling up this mountain. Each player gains a sanity board that they place next to their main board, and there are a few things going on here. The first is the focus area. As you can see, there are red and blue arrows. Every time you increase your focus, you'll move this token along a blue arrow and gain the associated effect. If you lose focus, you move from where you are across a red arrow and you lose the associated benefit. So as you gain and lose focus, this is going to be moving around the board. Down below, we have a sanity track. This can potentially give you end game points or lose you end game points, and these can also affect things like the weight that you are carrying. It's worth noting out here, there are one time effects as well as ongoing effects on the focus track. Now you will be able to move over here depending on the weather die. Whenever a sun is rolled, then that will give the current player one focus. And every time a blizzard is rolled, Every player who is not in a camp is going to lose one focus. If you are ever in the middle and you have to lose focus, you instead lose sanity. Now, I do want to point out that you can use the sanity expansion with the competitive and cooperative modes, and there is a new way that you can perish on the mountain, and that is hypothermia. Now, as soon as your sanity marker reaches this marker at the very end, you remove this and you place that hypothermia marker onto the far right spot on your health track. I do want to point out that the Sanity expansion brings in two more climbers that you can use. Now, this hypothermia token is going to move one space to the left on every single one of the player's turns, and if their health marker ever reaches or exceeds that hypothermia token, then that player succumbs to the cold and they perish. Fortunately, when you are healing damage, instead of healing this way, you can move the hypothermia token to the right, although it's impossible to remove this token from the track once it is placed on there. This expansion brings in a ton of new cards that you can use, and again, you will specifically use various cards for the competitive and cooperative modes, and it comes with a sticker sheet. You can use this to apply stickers to the game board to give you reminders about when you're going to change your focus as well as your sanity. For example, you have these right here that you can place on the Karma track, and as you go past these, you will increase or decrease your focus, and you can also gain sanity by being at the top of the Karma track and gaining more Karma. So the more you drop down, the less focus you have, and the higher you go up, the more focus you have. Also, when you're playing the cooperative version, you can apply these stickers to the Sherpa track, and these will help you increase your sanity when playing that cooperative mode. In addition to these, there's also modifications to the Blizzard track. that You can add these stickers to the specifically indicated spots on the track for both sides of the board, and every time the Blizzard token reaches that specific spot, all of the tiles to the right and down from that location are removed from the board except for camps, solid ground, and secure locations. It's worth noting you can use this effect with any of the expansions or the base game. It essentially clears off tiles, so you have to re-find your way back down to the base camp because, of course, you're kind of losing your focus in the snow as you are hiking back down. Now, I did briefly mention it, but when you're playing the competitive version and you roll this die, that is going to affect your sanity as well as focus. And when you're playing the cooperative version, every time you increase the time, which means everyone has taken a turn, the event die is going to be rolled. And if an event symbol shows up, everyone gains a focus. And if there is not an event symbol, everyone will lose one focus. So, as you can see, when playing with the Sanity expansion, there's quite a bit more going on for all modes of play. In particular, with this focus board and Sanity track, you have to manage the benefits and the problems that you are gaining and losing as you make your way up and down the mountain. Now, of course, all of these were brief overviews of what the expansions can bring into the game, and I just wanted to give you an overview for how they work so you can decide if you want to add them into your game.
Now, at this point, the tutorial is coming to a close, and I hope you enjoyed learning how to play Summit. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgamescom support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.